It's a sunny Sunday afternoon in Palo Alto, the heart of Silicon Valley. And instead of going out with my friends to have brunch or go out to the beach, I'm in a diner with three guys. And you see, one of these guys has a technology. It's for snowboarders. And it's a bunch of sensors. One go on each wrist, one go around your waist, and one go around your ankles. And as you snowboard down the hill, it would actually track your ride and give you data and feedback about your speed and your jumps and your tricks that you were doing. And our challenge was we didn't know, like this, product, this technology would take a little bit of work to commercialize. We didn't know, is this something that people actually wanted? So in that afternoon, in that diner, I put together my first lean startup experiment. We created a website, uh, we put a value proposition on it, I actually created three, and we each put 100 bucks on the table, got some traffic and drove it to the site, and I got actual data back. And that is the moment that I fell in love with lean startup. Because, you see, I'd had a lot of positions. As I mentioned, I've been at three startups beforehand. And I always kind of took the position of trying to figure out what the customer wanted and then translating that into a product. And this is the first time that I actually had hard data that would give me information. Because if you pushed me before, I was all kind of, I would have to admit, I was kind of making guesses. So I fell in love with this, and then I went and I joined a team that was launching products based on Lean Startup. I started coaching teams to do Lean Startup. I started training people to do this. I ended up working and running an accelerator, um, and it was a great fun. And then about a year ago, I got a new opportunity. It was an opportunity to work uh, with scale-ups. So if you take the life of a startup, we know we start out small, we do our Lean Startup, Right? And, but then we get to this point where we get product market fit, and always we know it goes up and to the right every single time, right? And so I got to work with some scale-ups, and I wanted to see if all this early stage lean startup work we were doing actually helped the scaling process. And so I was curious, so the first thing I did is we had some research, and so I went and looked at it. And so someone had given us a database of 500,000 startups from around the world who had made it at least five years, which right there, that's a huge accomplishment. So it turns out if you look at these startups that have made it at least five years, 68% of them were making less than $250,000 per year in revenue as a company. Another 32% of them were making somewhere between a quarter million and 10 million. And only 0.4% of these startups actually we're making more than 10 million in revenue a year. And so when I saw this data, I was not very happy. In fact, you might have said that my face looked a little bit like this, right? And the reason that I was so unhappy was, I think about all of us when we're starting our initiative, I don't think any of us are here saying like, oh, I hope if I take this great risk and try really hard to launch this product and work at it for five years, I'm going to have less than $250,000 a year in revenue. And you know, when I look at this, I think more than 0.4 of the startups are actually doing lean startup. And so I was kind of very confused about what was going on. And so because I was confused, I do exactly what I tell my teams to do when they're confused. I went out and I started talking to some customers. And so I went and talked to some very successful Dutch scale-up entrepreneurs and some very successful Dutch scale-up investors who are investing in like the Series B stage. And when I talked to the scale-up entrepreneurs, they were like, one of them told me, is like, Janet, I attribute 100% of my success to being able to set this goal-setting methodology I'm doing called the Rockefeller Habits, where I can set a five-year goal, a three-year goal, and I can execute towards those goals. And I was like, wait, what? But what about the, you know, the product and the customer iterating and, and, and getting that right? And he's like, no, 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 that's not important. So I was like, what? And then I went and talked to this investor, and he's like, Janet, the most important thing for me to make my decision is who is the CFO, because I want to see if they can manage cash and execute. And I was like, yeah, but what about, you know, the product and the customer and iterating and doing that? And he's like, no, 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 that's not important. So at this point, I kind of got really upset because I'm like, what have I been spending all my time doing? <laughs> and so I had to think really hard about what was going on. And what I came up with in the end is I think that these scale-up entrepreneurs face two challenges. So the first challenge is that uh, when they start up, 
they have the innovation engine that they have to get going. And this innovation engine is this is where we're identifying customer needs, we're doing our experiments, and we're running MVPs. And so they get that innovation engine going. But once they hit that product market fit and start scaling, they have to bring a second engine online. And this is our business engine, where they have to build the, the company infrastructure. They have to put in place processes. They have to hire the right people. They have to set goals and start executing. And so the question becomes for these entrepreneurs, can they have these two engines running at the same time? And it's not easy, I'll tell you. And I think this is why the scale-up entrepreneur and the scale-up investor were all focused on the second engine, because this is the engine that has to come online to start scaling. They say, we know they can already do the innovation engine. The question is, can they bring online the second engine? And so I think the scale-up curve is not so much this, where we go up and to the right like that. I think it actually, there's a break. And what happens is there's a curve, it flattens out, and we have to switch to a new curve. And there's this transition point that happens where the founders have to go from a team to a company, from a founder to a CEO, from first to recurring revenues, and from projects to processes. And this is not such an easy transition to make. The second, so this is our first challenge, is bringing online that second engine. And this gets to the ambidexterity that everybody talks about. And this is where it starts to happen. The second challenge is a little more subtle. But if we look at these two curves, the one on the left, I say, this is where we're building something that is scalable. And the one on the right is we're actually doing the scaling activities. And it's not till we get to the curve on the right, we figure out whether or not did we build something that's scalable in some sense. And so I think to have a truly scalable business, you have to have four things. You have to have a great business, a competitive edge, delighted customers, and rapid prototyping. And I'll go through each one of these to explain why I think they're important. So the first one is scalability, is a great business. And Alexander, with the business model canvas, has made a great contribution here. Um, and it helps teams really think about what is my business model. I'd like to add two things to this. For a really great business, it has to be working in an attractive market and have to be having a scalable business model. So let me tell you about some research we did over the summer. We spoke with 114 Dutch startups, such as those who are here on the stage or on the screen. And we got them to fill out a survey, which, believe you me, getting startup founders to fill out a survey is not easy. They are very busy people. And of these 114, we kind of found that they fell into two groups, naturally. They both had the same amount, the same age, and there are a lot of similarities. But what differentiated them is one of them was scaling, and the other one wasn't quite scaling yet. And how we distinguish this is based on FTE growth. Those that were scaling had a minimum of 15 employees and were growing at a minimum CAGR of at least 20% per year. The median was 35 employees and a 67% CAGR. And those that we call potential scale-ups that we hope one day will start scaling had less than 15 employees, even though they're the same age, and they were, uh, had less than a 20% per year CAGR in growth. The median was uh, 10 FTEs and a 14% CAGR. And so then we started asking, well, what are the differences between these two groups? And it turns out there were some significant differences. For example, the net profit margin of the industry in which the startup was working tended to be much greater for those that were scaling. And that makes sense. If you're in a high profit margin industry, like that gives you cash, right? You're making cash every time you sell products. And yet I rarely hear a startup entrepreneur say, I am so excited to launch a business that's going after this high profit margin industry. We don't do that. We say, I'm going to solve this problem, or I've got this product. We get all excited on that. And yet it turns out those entrepreneurs that pick products and problems that tend to be in high growth margin industries have a much higher probability of scaling. In fact, I know if you ask which is the most important market, product, or team, I know most people out there would say team. But I'm going to give you an argument for market. And I'm not alone with this. I have here Mark Andreessen, who's the founder of Netscape. And he now has gone on to uh, found Andreessen Horowitz, which if you look at as far as the US venture capital firms, they are number one. And Mark Andreessen says, in a great market, 
a market with lots of real potential customers, the market pulls the start the startup, excuse me, the product out of the startup. Another study that was done was by Bill Gross, founder of Idea Lab out of Los Angeles. He gave a TED talk on this where he looked at 200 startups to try to figure out what made them successful. And he found out that timing was actually the most important thing. So not only do you want a large, attractive market that's growing, you want it to be a wave that's moving fast. And I say, I don't care how good of a surfer you are, if there are no waves in the ocean, you're not going anywhere. But if you catch a big wave, you just have to marginally stay on the surfboard and you're getting a good ride. So I really think it's important to think about the market. The other thing it's important to think about is how scalable of a business model do you have? And these are things like increasing returns, viral dynamics, economies of scale. So increasing returns is the more people use your product, the more valuable it becomes. Um, viral dynamics is people are encouraged to share your product. And economies of sale is, you know, if you make 10,000 units, it's less expensive than if you make 100. So my example here, if you look at the revenue per employee at a bunch of companies here, tech industry companies, and we have Apple at the top, where they're getting $2 billion for each additional employee they add in revenue. And you know, the bottom of this list is Yahoo with only a half a billion per employee added. And if I compare that with, let's say, another industry that has great products, but the consulting firm, uh, they have a much, much lower, because this is a much harder business to scale. And in fact, this is not even to scale, because I couldn't make the top group's numbers big enough till you could see the, small, the bottom group's numbers. But for a consulting firm, every time you want to increase your revenue, you have to add another person. So it's really important to have a scalable business model. The second thing that I think is important is having a competitive edge. And my image I use here is a moat. And I use this because one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett says, a truly great business must have an enduring moat that protects excellent returns on invested capital. The dynamics of capitalism guarantees that competitors will repeatedly assault any business castle earning high returns. And the competitive edge could be a different, bunch of different things. It could be a, something that you own. IP, a patent, maybe it's a scarce resource. It can also be a skill that you have. I learned recently that there are only 20,000 top-rated um, big data analysts, computer programmers in the world. If you have one of them, that is a competitive advantage. It's a privileged relationship or a network effect. But these alone might not be enough because I give for the Dutch people might recognize this example hives in 2010, they had 10 million accounts. It's a social media network. There are only 16 million Dutch people. And yet when Facebook rolled into town, the competitive moat was not enough, and within a year, they were out of business. So if we go back to our Dutch startups from the survey, we see that those who are scaling have a higher likelihood of having unique or proprietary technology or proprietary assets. Now, this difference isn't as big as the, uh, the market that I showed you, but it, there is still statistical significance here. And in the business world, every little edge you can get makes a big difference. So the third area that I want to talk about is delighting customers, right? And this is, we all know, we can't be just 5% better. We have to be 10x better. And when we started digging into this area, this is where I started to get kind of happy. Because if we recall, if you look at it, delighting customers is really just customer development. And this is something that we all know how to do in Lean Startup. And my favorite question to ask to ensure that I've got 10x better is I go by Sean Ellis's, Ellis's question from, he was the first marketeer at Dropbox, and he would always ask, how disappointed would you be if this product was no longer available? And if you get at least 40% of the people saying, I'd be very or extremely disappointed, that's a very good sign. I once worked with Philips on launching the One Blade. It was a new blade shaving system for them. And we, in the pre-market launch part, we were asking customers this question. We had let them try the product, then we asked the question. And we got a 94% result of people saying, I would be very or extremely disappointed. And that was the point we knew we had it. We went to market, and it exceeded their expectations in sales by five times, and they had a hard time keeping it on the shelf. So we knew we had it. 
And if we go back to our Dutch startups, uh, the question for me that comes to this is the ability to increase loyalty, because why do I want delighted customers? I want them to keep coming back and buy, me, buy from me. And we can see, again, those who are scaling up feel that they have a greater ability to increase customer loyalty. Makes sense. So the final area that we have is rapid deployment. And this here is where I say you have to be like a flu virus. Like every year there's a new vaccine that comes out, but every year that flu virus is evolving and mutating and moving fast, right? And this is our prototyping, our market trials, our feedback and our improvement. And when I started to see the importance of this in the scale-ups, then I started to get really excited because this is really lean startup. And although it's super important at the early stage, I feel like it's very important to have this skill to, for a scale-up. Let me give you an example here. I have Brian Chesky, the founder of Airbnb. And he's talking, he talks and he says, the first stage of a startup is survival. Not dying is being able to work on it the next day. The second stage of a startup is firefighting. There are all these problems going on and you have to fix them all. The third stage is now other people can see what you're doing and now other companies try to copy and destroy you. The challenge, the problem with these challenges is they are punch in the face when you're casually walking down the street. You have no idea where they're coming from. And as my, my favorite quotes from Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So when you're doing your experiments, right, we have to move fast and be agile in the lean startup phase, but you have to have that muscle really embedded in your organization because once you start scaling, people notice you and start throwing punches at you, and you have to be able to dodge and weave and evolve and handle that. And so it's a very important skill. As Eric Ries says, the only way to learn or to win is to learn faster than anyone else. So... Those are the four skills that I think that, an, uh, four competencies that an organization must have embedded in it before it starts scaling that will then help the scaling process once they start. So it's a great business, it has a competitive edge, there's delighted customers, and they have rapid prototyping. So with my companies that I work with now, I've actually created a little questionnaire for them a self-assessment questionnaire for them, where it kind of walks through all these things and kind of uh, lets them ask themselves, am I ready to scale? Do I have everything I know, need? Uh, and if you would like, because uh, I know many of you are uh, working at your own equivalent of a Palo Alto cafe on a Sunday afternoon, and you might have your own project that you're working on, either an entrepreneurial venture or at a big company that you're thinking about launching, I put it up on our website, uh, and you can feel free to download it. It is an MVP, I have to say. So um, I put my email address up there. If you think there's anything that you needs to be changed on it, or if you can help me improve it, I would love to hear from you. I also realized I didn't put a scoring rubric in there because I feel like you can't really say, like, if you get a score of 73% or more, you know, you're good to go. It's much more complex than that. So it's kind of thinking about, do I have all these scalable elements in place? Um, so whether you're working for on an entrepreneurial venture or a large corporate venture, uh, I wish you well. I hope you don't get punched in the face too hard. Uh, and I hope you can scale well. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. I would definitely um, rate your talk at 73% uh, or more. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we actually have some time for, for questions uh, if uh, the audience would like. So, um, you know, wave and, uh, and I'll throw uh, the cube at you. There we go. Um, yes, I'm going to get a little bit closer and from this angle. There we go. Excellent. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering. Uh, the competitive edge that you were talking about yeah. and the questionnaire when you asked the startups in, in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. was it something that they judged themselves that uh, they have a competitive edge in something or how did you determine that? Um, so it's interesting because you, if you ask somebody like, hey, do you think you have a competitive edge or are you a sitting duck in the water? Like, it, you know, you have to think about how you ask that because so we tried really hard to ask them to give them two alternatives that would each sound equally enticing and ask where they would place themselves. So that's where we talked about, um, you know, do you have uh, proprietary technology or are you, you know, developing on open standards or something like that and see where people uh, fell out. Um, so yeah, it's kind of an art form to get that. And I have to admit, the survey when it came back, 
it just had more questions for me because, you know, it came in with some great insights and now I'm just even more curious to say, how did they think about their competitive advantage? Cool. Any, any more questions? Come on, it's okay. <laughs> any, anybody? Well, yeah, oh. here, here we go. Uh, could you, yes. Wow, thank you, both great job. So, um, is there any difference between Dutch startups and American startups or anywhere else in the world where you would see this because your conclusions yeah. are based on the Dutch startups? No, so our research was entirely on the Dutch startups, so I, um, that's all I can speak about is the Dutch startups. We also have a group that we work with down in Africa and they're actually starting to serve there or like, you know, do this research down there as well. Uh, and I'm totally curious, maybe completely different things drive it there. So um, I don't know the answer to that. Sounds like a definite maybe. A maybe, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Well, actually, a question to you. What, what kind of questions do you often get when, when people see this survey? What, what are the things that they are dying to know? Um, so I gave it to, we have, uh, I'm working right now with a group of 30 scale-up entrepreneurs and they were in with us last week and so I gave it to them for the first time, the survey questionnaire. Um, and it's one of those questionnaires where if you answer A, it means you're probably like, uh, not so good. B, kind of middle of the road. C, really good. Uh, and afterwards, I asked him, how was that for you? And most of the answers were, they, people said, painful. Because <laughs> it was a little bit of a realization. And there's cases, like, you have to use your own judgment. Like, you might say, gosh, I'm an A on here, but I understand that. And for my business, that's okay. Um, and that's great. But if you, you know, you have to think critically for yourself whether or not it's important. These are things that, in general, tend to be important. Very cool. Cool. Any more, any more question? Last question. Don't be shy, it's okay. No? Okay. I'm off the hook. <laughs> then you're off the hook. Thank you so Great. much, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.